This is the end game. This is the goal. This is what Satan wants to lead you to believe. And his strategy is to chip away and to chisel away at your faith little by little with whisper after whisper of temptation, with whisper after whisper of logical reasoning and human thought as he leads you down a rocky road in the wrong direction toward this. And so as you endure and and face certain life situations, trouble, suffering, and other contexts of your life, Satan comes and whispers things like this. Look at all the wickedness in the world. Look at all the violence, the wars, the hardships, the hurricanes, the wildfires. God is mean. And eventually you start thinking like other people in this world. Why is there so much wickedness? How could a loving God do all of this? He must be an angry God. Or maybe you reflect on your own personal struggles, your own problems, the weight that you bear and those burdens, and Satan comes and whispers, God doesn't care. And you start wondering, now wait a second, if I'm his child, how come I have all of these problems? Why is it that I have this trouble and that problem and this thing going on in my life? Doesn't he care what's going on? Or maybe you start thinking about the grand plan of your life and how it's starting to unfold. Where are things going in my life? And Satan comes to whisper in your ear, God is unreasonable. And you think, yes, that's right. Why why would I have to go through all of this? It doesn't make any sense that I would follow this life path, that I would have these things going on, that I would go in this direction and trajectory for my life. And maybe even as you think about your life as a Christian, you might have this whispered into your ear, God demands too much. And you start thinking and and reasoning in your mind, this is too much. Look at all my other friends. Look at how much fun they have in their lives. They go to these other places and these other schools and and they don't worry about church and they don't have to sit through chapel or or stand for four verses of blessed Jesus at your word and and they don't have to worry about what words come out of their mouth or or what they do or don't do with their boyfriend or girlfriend and, and that's a sin and this is a sin and do this and don't do that. God is demanding too much. This week in our chapels, our worship, we're thinking about this theme, the cost of following Jesus. In fact, on Friday, we will hear Jesus himself tell us, count the cost, calculate, understand the price, the cost of following me. We're not talking dollars and cents here. He says, if the world hates me, they're going to hate you. If someone's a believer and someone else is an unbeliever, there's going to be division, even among friends, even among family. And then as the picture shows, Jesus will tell us, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. This is when Satan swoops in and starts whispering in the ear. And his main goal, I suppose you could say it this way, is to flip everything upside down, to get you to think in your mind that God does nothing but take stuff away. You're taking away all the fun in my life. You're taking away all the happiness in my life. Think about the Garden of Eden for a moment. Is this not what what Satan did as he came to Adam and Eve and there was this fruit and he convinced them to fixate on this and to have this thought, God must not love me because he's taking away all the fun. I mean, there's something with this fruit. It must taste good. It must give me more knowledge. It must give me more wisdom. There's got to be something to this. God must be mean and unreasonable. He's taking this away. But if they really looked around them, what was the reality? God had made an entire universe and they were the crown jewels of all of creation. What was the reality? They had an entire planet given to them to rule over and subdue and everything was to serve them and they were in perfect harmony with God. Even made in his image, God had given and given and given and Satan flipped it backwards. I guess God doesn't love me if I can't eat this fruit. I want you to think about today what this might look like in a real-life scenario with a story that many of us know. It's the story of Abram. I would think the freshmen are even at this point in Heritage of Faith by now. This is the calling of Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. 
It's just an introductory verse. But I want you to think how significant it is. First, think about all the things that God is not saying here. Abram, I'm going to give you a GPS with turn-by-turn directions. I'm going to give you a nice, comfortable car to go in. Oh, and here's the specific place you're going to be, and this is exactly what's going to happen to you. He didn't say any of that. Just go, and I'll show you. Then I want you to notice how God layers on the challenge to his faith. Go from your country, from your people, and your father's household. How quickly do you think Satan swooped in and flipped it upside down? Abram, look how unreasonable God is. Look how mean he is. You're 75 years old. Why would you get up and leave? Look, you're going to leave all your family. God is taking all this stuff away from you. He's just taking away all the joy and happiness of your life. Why would you follow this unreasonable demand and expectation? How many times in your life have you found yourself in those moments? You know what God says. Maybe you even know God's promises. And Satan flips it upside down. A loved one dies. And what comes out of our mouths sometimes? God, why did you take that person away from me? As if we forget God's promises about life that he gives. We have hardships and troubles, relationship problems, maybe in our own family, maybe boyfriend, girlfriend things, maybe friend things. Why are you giving me this hardship? Don't you care about what's going on? Satan flips it upside down when we fail to see the many, 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 many blessings that God gives to us in our lives that guide us day by day. Surely Abram had many times in his life where he failed to trust, where he failed to follow. But in this particular story, it's one of the reasons why we look to Abram as a hero of faith. Because he believed what God said next. He wasn't taking, taking, taking Look what God says. As Abram is considering this move to another land, he immediately follows with these words. God says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Notice how God doesn't say, Abram, maybe it will turn out okay for you. When you get there, you're going to have to work really hard and I hope you have some success. Good luck on that move. God doesn't take, he gives and gives and gives in his promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will do this for you. And so here comes the hero of faith part. Just amazing. I love it. It's just half a verse. So he went. Well, God, I don't know yet. Can you give me a couple nights to sleep on it? Well, maybe in a year I'll get all my stuff together. Maybe a decade from now my family will finally be ready and we'll move and we'll think about it for a while. No, he just went. He trusted and believed in God's promises because he knew the Lord. The God of gracious, compassionate love keeps his promises every single time. Understand what this story really is in the greater context of the Bible and of life. It's not just a guy moving to another place. It's not just a guy who's going to have a lot of children someday and then there'll be a fun song we sing in grade school about his many sons. This is God's greater promise. Did you catch that last line? All people on earth will be blessed through you because there's a greater promise yet to come a greater promise that God would fulfill in Jesus. Again, so often in our minds we think about what God takes from us. That's just Satan's lies. Look at what God gives to you in Jesus Christ. Think about Abram. Did Abram go out and seek and find God? No, God came to him. Did Abram do something special to deserve God saying, you know what, I'm going to bless you but not those other people. Did Abram do anything to stand out among sinners that God would say all peoples will be blessed through you because the Savior is coming through your line? No, God came to him. And in just the same way, in just the same way, has there been anything special that we have done to deserve this? Did we go out and seek and find God? No, he came to seek and find us. He came to live and die for us, for the whole world. 
because this is what God does, a God of love who gives and gives and gives, whose mercies are new every single morning. I suppose this is a, a fine enough theme for homecoming week, the cost of following Jesus. Because there might be things that Satan wants to flip upside down in our minds. Oh, here we go again. Here come all the rules. All they want to do is take away our fun. Why do we have to have chaperones monitoring how we dance and the parties before we're and before a dance and after the dance and, and how short the dresses are and how tight they might be and, and what we say at Mr. Wisco and all. They just want to take away all our fun all the time. I don't know if this is really worth it. Could it be that Satan is flipping upside down? God's just taking away when the reality that we see at the cross is that God gives and gives and gives his grace day after day after day. And the reality is then in his promises, could there be anything more fun more enjoyable than life everlasting with him? Than seeing your loved ones one day and being reunited, reunited with them for all eternity? Whatever fun or silly thing you think you might want to do during homecoming week or the homecoming dance night, could it ever compare to the joy of knowing you have an eternity not in hell, that your sins are forgiven, that you do have a life with Christ and peace that surpasses all understanding? God gives and gives and gives. You see, when it comes to the cost of following Jesus, as we look at the troubles of life, the real cost to look at is what Jesus paid for us to make us his children in life everlasting. May God give us a faith of Abram to trust in his promises and to focus on what he gives to us at the cross and in Christ, now and forever. Amen. We'll join together in prayer and the blessing and then please remain seated for an announcement after chapel. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, help us to see with eyes of faith the promises that you fulfill at the cross in Christ and help us to know then that you keep every promise for us, that you are with us always to the very end of the age, that you do work all things for our good because you do love us. Help us to clearly identify the lies of Satan to ignore them, and to trust in you as we walk toward life everlasting. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.